I'm Denny Somak. And back in the 80s, as a producer, I kept my eyes and ears on what was happening in the global world of rock. Something was happening in the UK, and it wasn't happening in the US. Her name was Kate Bush. Kate was 19 when she topped the UK singles chart for four weeks with her debut single, Wuthering Heights, became the first female artist to achieve a UK number one with a self-written song. That was in 1978. She wasn't well known here until very recently when her song Running Up That Hill was featured on season four of Netflix's uh, Stranger Things. But I was an early fan, so I got my British correspondent to interview her in late 1982 as she was releasing a video, a VHS as a matter of fact, uh, of her live show. And um, let's listen to this rare conversation with Kate Bush, where she talks about her unique approach to songwriting and uh, performing. And then I'll be back to talk about her life and career over the past 40 years. Hi, this is Kate Bush here in London. Well, tell us, Kate, what the, the tape the video of your concerts are all about in America. Uh, firstly, I think there's a bit of a, a misunderstanding that uh, some folks think that it's Kate Bush in 1983. In fact, it's a bit earlier than that, isn't it? Yes, I think obviously because it's being promoted and released at this time, people are probably going to presume that it is a current event, which is quite um, reasonable. <laughs> but it was in fact made in 79 at the time of the tour. and. Um, I think because perhaps of its success in Europe and uh, in this country here, they feel that it would perhaps go down well in America. You think maybe there's also an element of, uh, of your record company perhaps looking at you as an artist and trying to revive a little interest in you because it's been a year or two since you've really made a name there in musical terms at least. I think um, it's not really that problem. I think the problem is that they want to initially find a way to break me. And uh, because this last album was the first one to be released in America since The Kick Inside, there's not really been any area for promotion, let alone, um, you know, the media comeback. So I think this is really, in many ways, the first attempt to make a genuine break there. And uh, they feel that the live video is particularly right for the American market. They, uh, they feel some of the songs are right and the whole fact that it's a live presentation they feel will go down well. So I think that is very much why they're releasing it. The other thing is that um, the cable television thing has boomed in America and now we have things like MTV, the music channel in America, where a lot of these sorts of special programs are being aired. And I guess to some extent, bands like Duran Duran have done very well in America because of that visual opportunity, the outlet, in addition to radio. So maybe they're thinking the same thing that with you, that they'll have another crack there as well. Yes, I think um, MTV has certainly opened up a major area for breaking new artists. I mean, there's no doubt that you could tour the whole of America and perhaps not get as much attention as a major video being shown on MTV. Um, and from what I've heard, it sounds like Duran Duran were mainly broken on the videos that were shown. And so, obviously, again, I think the company, seeing that I have a lot of videos already made and that I'm quite a visual artist, they feel that it's probably quite a um, straightforward way to do it with me. Well, tell us a little bit about the 79 recording and uh, which period of your career that was what what was the show about w was there a theme to it and what were the songs that you were singing at the time well that show was very much the representation of the first two albums and was basically putting visual interpretation to the songs and uh, i think there was only one or two songs left off and um really that's how i see the shows as being when I've got enough material to then visually um, put together, that's what I like to do. And it's a shame, really, that I couldn't do a show this year to sort of um, visualise the last two albums, but it'll just have to be three albums mm. next time. Now, the shows that you do, the live shows, are as important as the records, as far as you're concerned, and you put a lot of effort and energy and expense, I would have thought, into the shows, a lot of dresses, a lot of costumes, and dance as well. It seems appropriate that we're in your dance rehearsal studio today. It's a slightly hollow sound, and, and here we are talking about that aspect of you. You're not just a singer, but you're a performer, a dancer as well, aren't you? 
Yes, uh, I seem to have become so. I mean, I think I, I got interested in dance um, originally when I saw a Lindsay Kemp production, knowing that there was something more I wanted to add my mu to my music, but not knowing what. And it suddenly made sense that movement was a perfect complement to music, in that they're both expressions of emotional uh, turmoil or whatever. Um, so it made sense to put the two together, really. And... Um, uh, again, especially the video medium, it's it's perfect to uh, exploit in. Now, going back to the dreaming and uh, talking about that musical project, it was rather unique for you in in that you did most of the production, if not all the production, on it yourself, as well, of course, of, of, of singing that very unique voice of yours, didn't you? Tell us about that project and how that came about, why you did it that way. Well, I think, really, the production thing has been something that has been gradually growing as uh, my career's been moving on. I mean, really, the first album was the only album where I had no true say um, over the producer. And uh, gradually, as I did album by album, I found that what I was having to do, really, was basically convince the producer that what I wanted w would work. So um, it came to a stage where I wanted to go for pro producing myself but wasn't totally brave enough. Um, so I went for a co-production with my engineer, John Kelly, and um, that worked very well. And then uh, writing songs for this last album, they sounded very different again from the stuff that I'd done before. And I just felt that it was something I could handle as a producer, so I felt it was worth a try. And having got three tracks down and they sounded good, then everyone felt good, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But I think it is really something I've... I've wanted since the second album, where I felt that if I could just um, have more control over it, I could get more of what I want to be said on the album. And so far that has worked, so I hope it continues that way. How do you see yourself as a recording artist and a performer today? Because uh, if we go back to the, the late 70s, the beginning of, of your pop career, you had sort of chart success in this country and you were blazoned all over the newspapers because you were this strange woman, strange image that uh, you had. You weren't the atypical, sexy, upfront female performer, but you offered something very different. Now, that's all been and gone in a way, and there's a different point in your career now. How do you feel about that changing style and changing image, and, and maybe the f also the change in that you don't have sort of top ten singles anymore? Does that bother you, that sort of thing? I think there definitely has been a change, and I like to think that the change has sort of again moved with my music. Um, I think I still have problems, especially in media, with the, um, the mentioning of anything to do with sex. But I think it's a very positive thing that people have started moving away from that with me, and have in fact started taking me much more seriously as an artist. Um, I can't remember the rest of the question. So a long question, was, really. I think it was a bit about um, how you feel about having chart success and oh, then yes. not having it, really. Yes. I mean, the, like Wuthering Heights was, what, the biggest hit that you yes, had in, in right. Britain. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you've been able to parallel that since. I wonder how, that, how you feel about that. I think um, it is often quite a difficult thing, especially when your first single is a number one hit. It's very difficult for people to think of you ever having made another record since. But I think, in many ways, perhaps the single success in that they were charting and that I was in the papers all the time added to this kind of image that I had that perhaps wasn't right for my music. It was right for someone who was having um, chart successes, but it wasn't necessarily right for the type of writer and, and the music that I was making. And I think, in a way, perhaps moving away from being a sort of poppy artist to perhaps more a rock artist, if people would call it that, um, I think it has helped very much with people's attitudes towards me. Do you think also the fact that, as an artist, you've um, diversified your interests and therefore you've kept ahead? There's a, there's a little bit of mystique about you, that you're not an atypical pop top ten artist. You're a bit like in a sense, a parallel situation with Toya, where you've both, not necessarily the same musically, but you've both been into, say, acting or dance, and you've kept a distance from that atypical image of just being sort of top ten, as you say, moving into rock. Do you think that's helped you? Well, I think the, the big difference is, again, if you're writing your own material, then you can, to a certain extent, 
move within um, your own limitations. You're not necessarily stuck to one kind of formula for a song or whatever. And I think that, um, that certainly helped me to not get stuck into one image, even though that's still something that does happen. I'm not stuck in, in one image as much as I would be if it wasn't for the fact that I wrote my own material. I think I can sort of change the directions that I'm moving in because of that. I'm not reliant on other people writing it for me. Moving back to the video now, if that is a success and one hopes that, that it will be in America, will, will it uh, entice you to perhaps go over and do some live performances in America? Well, I, I think the live performances is not something I can just, oh great, it's, the record's a hit, let's go over and do a show. It takes so much time and like you're saying, a lot of money and a lot of effort. And um, it's something that has to be worked out over a period of six to nine months. And that's just really the rehearsal before the show starts. So what I do really want to do is get this album that I'm writing on now out the way, and then I'll be able to think about a show, something that I've wanted to do for a good few years now. But um, because it takes me so long to record an album, I have to uh, just wait for myself, as it were. The Dreaming was a complex album in some ways. I think uh, reviewers of that album in the music press said, you know, it was a, a very complex, a lot of production. Some people even said it was overproduced. Looking at that and what you're doing now, how, 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 how do they differ, or are there similarities? I don't know. I mean, and also, what do you think about the criticisms? <laughs> well, I think that there seem to be two main kind of criticisms, and one was like, you know, oh, God, she's really gone over the top now, you know, like, uh, just lost my head. <laughs> and the other uh, set of critics seem to be saying that they actually thought it was really good and, and worth listening to. And... One of the interesting things was that um, the American reviewers seemed to really, really like the album, which was fantastic for me because um, I feel it is the best thing I've done so far. And obviously it's really nice to read things that people are saying that confer that, that they think it's the best thing you've done as well. And that was the impression that I was getting from the American reviewers, that they really did like it. Um, I think there are similarities, obviously, but um, I think... Like the third album was different from the fourth album, I think this is again different. Um, with the, the amount of time that travels between each project now with me, I change a lot and I go through very different moods. And um, so far I would say that this album is, is different. Perhaps not so intense, but obviously you know, the, the same kind of style. Have you written any song titles so far? Are you just working out musical ideas at the moment, rhythms and patterns? Uh, well, mainly it's song by song that I'm working, and it has been very slow, but I think I needed a rest this year because um, last year, really, I was so exhausted from the last album. It was a very demanding project to have to get involved in, especially having to do so much from production to actually performing on it. So I think I just needed to take a break and, you know, get all my fuel back in so I could have some new stimulus. And I think that's helped, you know, I feel that the stuff that's coming out now is quite different, quite positive. Uh, I'll have to wait and see. Doing a lot of uh, dance as well, are you? Rehearsing and dancing. For yes. what? Yes, Just I for was. yourself or for health reasons? Well, Exercise? Um, originally, I felt there was nothing happening musically. I was sitting down trying to write and um, I wasn't getting any ideas coming out. So I considered that complete exhaustion both mental and physical. So I decided probably what I had to do was feed myself again. So I spent ages just reading books and getting back into dancing uh, with a new teacher who was fantastic because uh, I mean, she's a brilliant dancer and was very hard on me in the classes. So within a couple of months, I was really back to shape again. But um, then I found that I was spending so much time sort of working on the stimulus, I wasn't actually getting down to the writing. So I just put a stop to that and ever since I've been working on the writing. But it seemed to work, it seemed to clear the block a bit. So, All things pointing in a positive direction. How do you see 1984? I ask a lot of people this because 84 conjures up that big brother image in us all and it seems to be that point uh, where people talk about things are going to happen in 84. Well, I, I think it actually feels very positive from a, you know, an emotional and creative point of view. I think there's lots of good things in store for people that are trying to be creative. But it does feel a bit like this year an awful lot of biggies have happened politically and um, managerially, shall we call, in the mm. world. 
So uh, I hope that goes down and doesn't uh, turn into anything. But I don't think it will. I think it's going to be a good, good year. Good for Kate Bush too. Yeah, good for all of this. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's our interview with Kate Bush, recorded in late 1982, a couple of years before she wrote and recorded her album Hounds of Love. That was released in 1985 and topped the charts in England at the time. So let me give you a little background on, uh, on Kate. After her debut with, as we mentioned, Wuthering Heights, she went on to have several top 10 hits in the UK, but she never really had much success in the US. Wuthering Heights barely made an impact on the charts in America. In May of 2022, the hit Netflix show Stranger Things used Running Up That Hill in an episode. And that's what caused the 1985 single to climb the US charts. It hit the Billboard Hot 100 at number eight and became the most streamed song in the world on Spotify. And it's made her one of the most searched names on the web. A couple of interesting facts. She was signed to EMI Records after David Gilmour of Pink Floyd helped her and produced her demo tape. Also, Pat Benatar did a cover of Wuthering Heights on her second album. So she was hip to her. And uh, Kate's been nominated three times for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, most recently, 2022. Now, with all her accomplishments, she hasn't done many interviews. So I hope you enjoyed this rare glimpse into her world. It's a, a real piece of audio history from my classic rock archives. So this is The Rock Podcast. You can contact me through the website, therockpodcast.com. You can send me an email at hello at therockpodcast.com. Look for me on Facebook. That's it for this episode. Tell your friends, keep in touch. Goodbye for now.